Hello everyone, my name is Ben Eady and I'm the online media manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Create a BA Center of Excellence, Improve Business Outcomes and Innovation. Today's featured speaker is John Parker from Focus Solutions and the webinar will last approximately 60 minutes including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. I would also like to say thank you to Unfocus Solutions for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'll turn it over to John to get us started. Hey, thank you, Ben. Um, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we do have a lot to cover. I think you'll like the material. There's a lot of uh, kind of new research that I'm presenting today. So basically, uh, let, let's get started. So, you know, basically today's topic is really creating a center of excellence, you know, for business analysis. So let's really look at really why organizations should focus on business analysis to begin with. Uh, Basically, it is to deliver more successful projects. Organizations have invested heavily in project management over the last 15 to 20 years. They have not really had the payback because basically projects still fail. They're still failing at approximately the same rate that they were. But the reason why is, okay, we now know the major cause of challenge or failed projects is basically poor requirements, lack of user input, and changing requirements. Most of these things are basically problems with business analysis. We also know that uh, we have a lot of scope creep problems, and most of that also has to do with business analysis. So focusing on business analysis makes a huge difference for successful projects. Also, eliminating waste. Uh, there's a lot of rework on projects. About 40% of the cost of a project is related to reworks, rework, and of that, industry you know, research shows that about 70% of that's related to poor requirements. If you think about it, 28% the cost of IT projects is related to requirements rework. Uh, that's a lot of money and a lot, of, a lot of savings opportunities. Also, eliminating unnecessary functionality. According to research by the Standish Group, 49% of functionality that's developed is never used. This is just a complete waste because we basically have to pay for the development organizations do, and we also have to pay for maintaining it. So that's a lot of money. Uh, delivering more business value. Using good business analysis techniques, organizations can really increase the return on investment. There's a lot of research that basically shows that if you, that you, if you put in good benefits realization management practices uh, based on business analysis, you can actually increase your actual rate of return on projects by three times. That's huge. Okay, certainly under, you know, obtaining better understanding of business needs, achieving results faster, and providing better solutions that can actually meet the needs of the business. These are all reasons why to focus on business analysis. However, the challenges for business analysis are really many. First of all, uh, business analysis is a relatively new profession. We now have a, a professional trade organization in IBA, but if you compare it to the maturity, say, of PMI, it's, it's really small. We have maybe 1 20th of the members. Um, we're, we're fairly new, the organization's growing, but also because of that, business analysis really kind of operates at a low maturity level. And a lot of organizations, business analysts are spread all over the place. And there's kind of like fragmented reporting. There's many different titles. Um, some are in the business units, some are in IT. Another thing that really hurts a lot is simply culture and perception. Uh, sometimes business analysts are just reviewed as requirement writers and their value simply is not fully understood. These are all big challenges. Oftentimes when organizations start to do something about business analysis, such as create a center of excellence or whatever, they have a tough time really integrating these things into existing life cycles, such as project management or systems development or business process improvement. All these other life cycles have already been there. They're already established. And so really for business analysis to work, it has to fit into this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to IIBA. Let's take a look at BA Bach, because most of the time when I'm talking about business analysis today, I am definitely talking about business analysis with an IS, not business analysis, not, not the business analyst, which, which is with an ST. So business analysis, according to IIBA, is a set of tasks and techniques used to work as liaison among stakeholders in order to understand the structure, policies, and operations of an organization and recommend solutions that enable the organization to achieve its goals. 
They define a business analyst as any person who performs business analysis activities, no matter what their job title or organizational role may be. So this would include people such as systems analysts, requirement engineers, product managers, product owners. It also includes project managers because they do a lot of business analysis activities. It even includes teams, uh, agile teams, and agile product owners. So as you can see, there, there's a lot of roles, and business analysis really incorporates a lot of different things. But um, let's look at how to transform business analysis. Okay, well, the first place to start is, is that you don't want to have to have a champion. Certainly, if you're going to create a center of excellence, that's what you're going to need. Or you're going to need you know, a ground roots committee or whatever. But to do this, you're going to have to demonstrate that you can produce a high return on investment for VA investment. Okay, so let's look at potential benefits that organizations have achieved from implementing or transforming business analysis. First of all, reduce rework for plan-driven projects. I already told you 28% of the cost is, is, is average for the industry, very well documented. Uh, probably not going to be able to save all of that uh, unless, you, unless you can be perfect, which we all strive to be, but none of us ever quite achieve. But certainly some range of uh, you know, 40 to 50% of that certainly is achievable. But if you look at that, that's huge. 10 to 15% of project costs, that will pay for a big investment in business analysis. And that's easy to prove. Okay, certainly for Agile projects, everybody's pretty happy that, with Agile because they, it produces better outcomes, higher satisfaction or whatever. However, recent research by Voke actually shows that Agile costs, there's no cost savings whatsoever. Okay, why is it there cost savings? Well, there's not there's cost savings because uh, there's too many iterations. In, term, in terms of being able to deliver something right the first time, it doesn't happen with Agile. It takes two, three, four, five iterations. Okay? And what we end up doing in Agile, which I love, by the way, we're, we're very Agile in our, in our shop, but people actually end up defining requirements okay, with code, bad practice. A lot better to have some type of balance. Do a little bit more research up front, take a user story, flush out good confirmations, flush out good conversations, and you can actually reduce the number of iterations, deliver things faster, reduce cost. So potentially from what I've seen in my research, probably that's 10 to 20 percent savings. There might even be a large savings on Agile because of some other benefits that you have, and it even would be on planning projects, which is kind of amazing. But cost, like I said, has not really been a, a major factor for Agile, but it should be. Uh, the key thing is eliminate unnecessary features. Huge, huge, because 64% of functionality, as I'll show you on, on an upcoming slide, it's basically functionality is just it's rarely or never used. Okay, if you can do a better job of determining what the features or the scope is, and you could basically prioritize those things correctly, there is gigantic opportunity for savings. So this is 20 to 30 percent of project costs. By the way, these things, you, you can't add all these things up. I mean, you, what you really want to do is you take this list, focus on one, two, or three of these things, show your, demonstrate to your organization conclusively that this fits within your organization, and then show your organizations uh, how you could basically produce a good return on investment. If you can demonstrate this, you can basically sell uh, an investment in business analysis and rather quickly, too, because the, the, pay, the payback is fantastic. Uh, okay, catching defects earlier and preventing production defects, huge savings there. We know that, that catching a defect in the requirements phase costs one one hundredth to one one thousandth of what it does if you caught it in production. So if we can catch defects earlier and we do a better job with requirements, guess what? We, we save a lot of money there. Certainly, I was working with an organization today, and they, they were having this failure with a lot of uh, 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 failed projects. They just weren't delivering results. They had to cancel them. They canceled 30% of their projects or whatever. Uh, uh, they've invested heavily in project management. Their, their failure rate is still the same. They know now that it's basically because of poor requirements, poor scoping, and things like that. So they're now looking for business analysis as kind of that solution. Okay, But that in itself... Uh, According to, according to good industry research, a big, big savings there. So I can tell you, I mean, really, uh, I don't normally tell people this because I really think of myself kind of as a business improvement guy, but I am a CPA, and I do have a lot of, uh, I used to always present business cases as a consultant to organizations. You can literally take this information and you can build a very strong business case to actually give to a CFO. 
However, like I said, if you don't have the information in your organization, take industry averages and show, demonstrate that you can, that you can show a positive return. If you do that, it makes a big difference. However, that being said, to produce a good return, you have to correct a lot of things. You have to really make sure that you're, you're kind of focusing on business analysis as end-to-end -end processes, not just as a little silo or whatever. Okay, let's just take two examples. And by the way, these slides are going to everybody. Everybody's going to get these slides. They'll, they'll be downloadable for a modern analyst. I've, I've already turned them over, so hopefully these things will be available. But let's just look at, let's just look at some ways, that maybe how you can sell an investment in business analysis to your bosses or whatever. One of the big ones is, is simply to reduce waste from rarely or never used functionality. So the Standish Group at, at the XP conference and in other conferences has actually shown this, that 64% of functionality is rarely or never used. 45% is never used, okay? So basically, if this is true in your organization, and by the way, this was done for, I think, something like a 1,000 studies, there's a huge opportunity here. I mean, it's not just savings on development. It's also savings on maintenance cost, deployment cost, quicker time to market, being able to achieve net present value quicker. So even this one little thing there makes a big difference. Okay, so how would you do this? Well, first of all, it's almost impossible to, to prioritize requirements. You've got a few thousand of them in a project. How do you do that? Well, you don't. You basically start a project off by defining the solution scope. And the solution scope is normally defined in features, or sometimes called epics if you're using Agile. Very, very important because those are easier to prioritize, easier to determine the value, and easy to eliminate ones that uh, really shouldn't have been done in the first place. Okay? In, in terms of making sure that the features are engineered correctly, assign, make it a partnership. Have a business sponsor and a BA assigned to each feature. Break, it, break your projects down that way. Okay, prioritize the features okay, that, that eliminate ones with little or no value. Okay, if you have X dollars that you're going to spend on a project, you should really only be focusing on really what delivers the most value. Focus on the 20% that delivers 80% of the value versus the, 80, the, the other side. Uh, you can't deliver all 100. That, that's wasteful. Don't over-engineer. Okay? Develop your requirements based on the solution scope. That is so important. And then, of course, even manage from a project management perspective the project the same way. I'll cover this a little bit later. But these, these ideas here are really just to give you some ideas of how you would present an investment of business analysis to, to your management. Okay, another big one is just development rework. A lot of people like to use this. Well, I, I, if you look at, there's been numerous studies in terms of uh, catching defects earlier and trying to reduce defects. But probably one of the recent works has been done by Carnegie Mellon and, and their Software Engineering Institute. But they actually said that 60 to 80% of software development cost is rework. It used to be less than that. Uh, the earlier numbers said 40%, but anyway, yeah, they're really precise because they're, uh, they're, they're the Software Engineering Institute. They take a lot of studies of a lot of organizations. Well, if you think about that, that's huge, 60 to 80%. Okay, now, according to, to them, uh, another study, Software Quality Engineering, they basically say that requirement defects account for 70 to 85%. So even if you take the lower number, 60% of Carnegie Mellon's software development cost is rework, and the lower number of, of, of requirement defects at 70%, multiply it together, 42% of the cost of an average project is related to requirement defects and, and rework you know, that results because of that. Okay, so cutting that down any, uh, certainly, you know, 10 to 15 percent of project costs is probably very conservative if you look at it. So there's good information on this. Um, use this. So let's look at just some, some general ideas. Of how do you have to achieve a return from business analysis? First off, business analysis processes cross over multiple functional areas. Okay, business anal analysis processes you have to define them end to end. Okay. And they need to address integration with project management, quality assurance, development customers, and users. You only focus on BAs to developers, probably not going to work. You're going to have to focus on really getting information from the customers, eliciting information there, eliciting information from users, make sure they participate, make sure the requirements are understood by development, make sure that QA can test using those requirements, and then making sure that the project manager knows how to use that information to better manage the project. That's end-to-end -end business analysis makes a huge difference. Okay, another thing, 
Okay, reduction in cycle times is critical for successful business analysis. Okay, so what you want to do is you can't produce a requirement document that, that gets implemented in code 18 months from now. I worked for a client over several years. That's, that was their big problem. We were actually able to get it from requirements to, to, to code within six months. I think it's, it's even better than that now. But you have to basically, okay, focus on cycle times. <clears throat> requirements age. And when they age, they're kind of like, uh, you know, rotten bananas or something like that, they kind of start to stink because they actually get outdated and then they really become a problem. So the main thing is is to develop, develop requirements quickly, turn them to development quickly, and cut down cycle times any way you can. How you do that? Move away from paper requirement documents to requirements that are, you know, to delivering just enough data just in time. Okay, transition from managing data uh, actually, I have this thing wrong. It should be transition from managing paper documents to managing data. Extremely important. What you want to do is, if you always wait, you have to produce a paper document, and it takes you three months to get out a, get a requirements document out. Okay, and then people review it. They even forgot what they told you. Probably the business needs already changed or whatever. The bottom line is, is when if you go and elicit needs from a stakeholder, they should be reviewing those needs in the next day or, the, or two days after that. And hopefully they're working with you. So getting faster feedback by continuously reviewing and validating requirements, very important. Even moving from this concept of reviews and approvals, it takes a long time. Maybe it takes three weeks to get a set of requirements approved. We could do that so much quicker if we could have people continually review things as we were developing things. Not going to work with Word, but if you can take a good tool such as focus requirements, we, you can do that. Okay. Uh, 64% of functionality is never used. Well, the problem here is that just represents waste, but a big, big opportunity for savings. Okay, the key thing here is just break the project into small pieces called features and, and prioritize those features. Eliminate the ones that don't deliver value. Okay? Uh, also realize that the real benefit from better business analysis is really delivering, delivering better business solutions. Okay? So if we can deliver better business solutions that result in better business outcomes, Huge. In other words, if we can help our organizations increase revenue, <clears throat> lower cost, achieve higher productivity, higher quality, and our solutions truly help them do that, that that's just huge. And that's really where we have to take business analysis is moving in that direction. Okay, another key thing is, is that the concept of, of having a business analyst write all the requirements, that's kind of ludicrous. Move away from that. Requirements need to be de developed collaboratively. They're no longer really owned just by a business analyst anymore. The business analyst may kind of oversee this. Guess what? Collaborative requirements development results in less rework, lower cost, better solutions. It's that plain and simple. Okay, so times have changed. Even looking at, and, and I, we work with a lot of organizations, both in terms of consulting and discussions and webinars and everything like that, but I'll tell you, it's time to abandon requirement practices of the 70s. This is going to seem a little bit strong, but times have changed. Some of these practices that people are trying to put in, even to try to improve requirements, yeah, they worked in the 70s, but we're not there anymore. I mean, things have really changed. First of all, development life cycles are fastly moving from waterfall to agile, and probably even agile to Kanban. We're actually now doing all of our development in Kanban because we want to deliver um, features to our customers much faster than even in a release. And so we're having great success with that. It makes it easier testing. We've actually been able to chop a lot of time off our own development cycle. Okay, requirement formats. We no longer really do shall statements anymore. You can look at IEEE and you can follow that, but we now use user stories. And even, even for plan-driven requirements, they, they work well because they make you focus on value. Okay, requirement documents. Um, we're moving away from that. These, these producing big paper documents that are just piles of paper that people have to review and it takes weeks, it just adds time and cost and we chop down trees. A better way is to start managing data, okay, managing backlog of items and making sure things move through that backlog. Okay, messaging before. You can even read like uh, some of the requirement stuff that's out there. There's actually like Encoge you know, has a thing that requirements are supposed to be developer focused. Well, that's totally wrong. Requirements really should be business focused. They should be delivering business outcomes. Yes, developers have to understand them, but uh, saying that requirements are developer focused, Forget that. Bad. Focus. Make a business focus. Deliver outcomes, and you'll, you'll be a real champion. Um, 
focus in the old way, we focused on delivering technical solutions. Now we want to deliver business outcomes. We want to make sure we understand how it's going to help the business. Requirement writing. Before we had requirements analysts. Now we, it's a collaborative team effort. Before for elaboration, we had to gather all details up front, continue to produce all this piles of paper. And then we would produce uh, 100 requirements. And then we'd produce another 100 requirements. And then the first 100 requirements would get old and aged and stuff like that. We really want to move away from that. We want to manage data. We want to do just enough, just in time. And we want to make sure that we have uh, this collaborative information kind of going back and forth between the business and the developers, with the business analysts in the middle, kind of coordinating this communication stream. Very important. Test cases were previously developed sometimes at the test phase. Now they're developed as part of requirements up front. And they're used in depth to understand the system and used by tests for testing. Uh, using Word or Excel as a requirement tool, that should just be totally abandoned. Wrong. You know, go to, go to like a, a true business analysis tool like a focus requirement suite. It'll make a huge difference for you because you can't manage, okay, data using Word or Excel. Those are document tools. So just to summarize, old way, technical solutions, new way, business value and outcomes. The old way, we manage documents, business requirement documents, market requirement documents, user requirement documents. We produce so many documents, okay, none of these things are really integrated or related, they, they would always get aged, that uh, it, it's almost impossible to manage that way. Think about it, the new way is we manage data. When the data is ready to give to development, we release it as it's ready. Even if you have waterfall, waterfalls are only delivered in phases, okay? So producing one requirement document up front for all three phases is crazy. Move away from that. Move away from at least that you're doing a you know, phase by phase at a time. Produce, you know, and release the data to development that way. Multiple versions of paper documents. Okay, this whole thing of trying to manage versions and version control and using SharePoint and all that. Forget that. Use, use an integrated database. The old way of giving, giving uh, development four books of requirements, you know, four three-ring binders of requirements and asking them to go through that and try to understand that and develop something from that. Uh-uh. Pass them data. Most of them use like a, an application development environment like Team Foundation Server from Microsoft or Jazz from IBM or uh, Jira you know, that, that we use. Pass the data electronically to them so that the information is synced. Forget this stuff about passing paper around. That's costing you time, costing you do dollars and just not working. Okay, so developing requirements. I actually gave a webinar on this last week, but this is a, uh, and it was well received. Uh, developing requirements really is a team sport. There's different types of requirements, and you really have to have input from everybody. And you know, in the old ways, we kind of had a business analyst that did a elicitation, analyzed what was said, uh, wrote specifications, and then validated it. Right? Well, that that still works, but not not really best. You're really a lot better to really have this kind of a collaborative process. And people work and they add information at different layers. Like I can guarantee you, like uh, executive sponsors, okay, what they really care about is business outcomes. They need to make sure those business outcomes are documented and put into a set of business requirements that everybody understands. Business needs, they carry much more about, okay, how do their processes work and their workflows, okay, and what data do they need to do their jobs and that type of stuff, right? So those are really more like stakeholder requirements. But sometimes they don't get documented very well. Too often, we develop a technical solution to automate the way we do things today, which is just maybe maybe screwing up faster versus uh, you know correcting things. So the key thing there is is that they need to focus on how things should be. How do we make the business and what's the solution we need to kind of make this stuff work? So I'm just telling you, requirements really is a team sport. Multiple people have to participate. Very very important. Okay, now collaborative requirements. It, it also even if you just look at it, uh, other, other ways why it's so important. Okay, there's a leading consulting firm that actually did a study. And what they found out was they were able to capture 93 to 90%, 95% of the functionality by using a collaborative requirements approach versus only 65% when a more traditional interview method was used. So organizations that stick with interviews, uh, elicit, you know, eliciting from stakeholders, analyzing those, that interview data, trying to do specifications to solution requirements and then trying to go back and validate that. First of all, we already know it takes a long time. We know it's very costly. But we also know now that, that it's, it's not, it, it doesn't work. Because you can see you know, even from this and some other studies, there's, there's problems here. So the key thing is, is really having joint responsibility for requirements. So here I'm really talking about 
uh, not so much product management, we're talking about IT in the business, okay? But you look at this. This was, a, this was put out by a IAG in a business analysis benchmark report. Look at the differences, okay, when the requirements were jointly owned between IT and the business. Every single thing improved, okay? Uh, budget is percentage target, better. Time is percentage target, better. Functionality is percentage target, better. Stakeholder time spent on the project, less. Everyone, every measure. So when they're jointly owned, the measures show this is, this is the way, uh, there's big benefits. So when you also talk about transforming business analysis, a lot of other things have changed. We're actually in organizations where a lot of organizations have Agile or some form of it. They have uh, COTS and SaaS solutions like cloud-based solutions. They have plan-driven development, and they have process improvement. So the main thing is, is to really make sure that you transform business analysis and kind of consider all of these things because probably your organization has them all if you're of any size. And the main thing is make sure that your methods and techniques work across these four areas. So let's look at eight quick, quick recommendations to really transform business analysis. First of all, transformation, as you can see, requires much more than just training business analysts. You can go out and get business analysts, and you can train them all you want, which we include, we actually include a lot of training in our tool, but it doesn't really help. You're really going to have to do more than that. You really have to look at end-to-end -end processes and making improvements there. Um, you also need to look at culture. You need to look at integration. There's a lot of things. You're also going to need like a good tool. You have to move away from Word and Excel. Those tools were tools that didn't even work in the 70s, and we know that. There's plenty of evidence on that. Okay, organizations, they have to transform from these archaic methods and processes. Okay, we need to, uh, we really want to put more focus on achieving business outcomes, okay? And business outcomes requires that you produce good business requirements, which we're going to cover a little bit later. You should also then put more focus on defining the solution scope, understanding impacts and, get, and gaps to, to enable change. Make sure that you also define stakeholder requirements. Uh, improve the quality of your solution requirements. And, and then implement solution assessment and validation. So I'm going to cover some of these topics a little bit later. And I'm really sorry because there's a lot of information here. And I know I'm going fast, but um, there's... Uh, you look at a copy of the presentation, I think you'll, you'll find this in kind of enlightening. Okay, first of all, end-to-end -end transformation basically requires that you take business analysis and you kind of need to integrate it into these other disciplines, okay? So project management, it should be integrated there. And ideally, take advantage of project by using a work breakdown structure that consists of requirement features, requirement bundles, and releases. Uh, and I've presented this to a lot of PMs, and they... Um, they all like it because it ties together kind of this business analysis. Instead of just using business analysis as a phase, we're now using requirements to kind of drive the project. We're also then really complying, okay, with what's in PMBOK in terms of the, the different requirement types we're supposed to define, and it, tie, and it ties with a lot of loose ends. Okay, development, obviously, they have to understand their requirements. So we want to deliver things to them electronically. We also want to make sure they participate in elaboration of requirements. You know, before, we just gave developers these requirements. We never really talked to them. I guarantee you they know uh, problems that need to be fixed. They have good ideas. They know the solutions. Some developers and some organizations, they think they know everything. So um, uh, if that's true, ask them. But get their input up front. Uh, don't, don't let them just kind of go wild with the solution. Make sure you get their input up front because they probably do have good ideas. They need to be considered. Quality assurance. Okay, they need to make sure they can test the requirements. If you have user experience people, send them to the operators their own little island, they should be included in this whole business analysis thing. What we don't need is, is business analysts producing wireframes and mockups and user experience people redoing wireframes and mockups and then giving them to a systems analyst that redoes it again in terms of how the user, user, true user interface is going to look like and then giving it to developers to change things again. We have to really make sure all this stuff's coordinated. Really the same thing with architecture and same things with business stakeholders. So as you can see, if you're going to transform business analysis, you have to kind of integrate it into these other pieces. We also need to make sure that we basically integrate into the life cycles, not just into the functions. So this is kind of a functional view. This is kind of a life cycle view. So if we have a development life cycle that looks like, okay, determine the business need, do the solution scope, concept and scope, define user needs, define and design solutions, build the solution, test the solution, deliver the solution. If you notice, uh, there's actually a business analysis life cycle that really kind of follows. 
Okay, and we actually have then pretty much deliverables or data that we produce at each thing. But we really have ideation of features, which helps us uh, determine what's going to get built, how it's going to be business needs or whatever. We then have features to requirements, which really gives us user needs and uh, and really the requirements is kind of our end result there. We give those requirements to development and support them to make sure they can build the solution and test the solution. And then we check with the users at the end in terms of uh, and, and making sure that we can transition to the solution and really make sure it meets their needs. If you look at this from a project management perspective, you should tie in there and you can see that the, the, you would normally have a vision, a set of features, a set of bundles, which is the requirements to try to rebundle this way, and releases is really how we're going to deploy it. And you can actually manage your project very effectively that way. So as you can see, we tie into the development life cycle. Our business analysis, our business analysis life cycles align. We also have aligned it with the project management life cycle. So we've integrated kind of all three. One of the things that I see a lot of confusion a lot of times is, is in this thing called stakeholder requirements. People say they, they elicit requirements from stakeholders. But really what they elicit is they elicit wish list of needs and then try to convert them into solution requirements and oftentimes these translations are wrong. Uh, stakeholder requirements is a specific type of requirement that's really uh, mentioned by IIPA in, in the BABOC and also by PMI in the, in the PMBOC. Um, but if you look at it, stakeholder analysis and requirements, they really are kind of distinct different types of stakeholders. There's the customer that cares about cost, ROI, outcomes. There's users. The only thing they really care is they want a solution that just makes their job easier, right? I mean, that's the big thing. If it has to make their job easier, that's what users want the most. It has to be easy to learn, no zero hassle, and helps them automate their activities. Business needs, they carry much more about how these different groups of users work together, so they carry much more about process design and information needs. Governance, regulatory, and compliance stakeholders, they care about standards, policies, and controls. And the technical stakeholders really focus on kind of architecture and support. So this information has to be elicited, but we really need to kind of keep this information separate and then, and then, and then use that to create our solution requirements. Oftentimes, we just leave it on paper notes and it goes away. So when, if you try to transform requirements, the key thing here is to move away from paper, uh, move to managing data, not documents. I'm going to cover more on this later. And business analysis process transformation is really making sure that you integrate business analysis and, and business analysis processes end to end into other life cycles and other functions okay, within your organization. Your organization may operate a little bit differently, very important. Okay, requirement types. Um, and, and I've presented this information in many other webinars before, but it really is, this is fundamental to business analysis, let's face it. We still produce requirements, and we produce different types of requirements. So according to BA Bach, we produce five types of requirements, business, stakeholder, functional, non-functional, and transition. Functional and non-functional together make up solution requirements. In PMBOK, they mention all of those plus project requirements plus quality requirements. So to really even comply with industry standards, we need to produce these things. And there is a, there is a real pain okay, if we don't do these things, if we don't keep them separate. Let's look at this way. Okay, the, the business requirements are really to describe why a project is being undertaken from a business perspective. Okay? If we don't do them well, what's the, what's the risk? Business outcomes aren't achieved. It really means that we expected to achieve a return on investment of 50%. We achieved nothing. Maybe the solution worked, but uh, big risk. Stakeholder requirements, okay, they're stated from the user's point of view and describe what's needed for a user to get her, his or her job done. Project risk, users' needs are not met, they refuse to use the system, and they revert to costly workarounds, and we see really no benefits. Um, and sometimes even systems that are developed that are just, that are just tossed, sad. That's part of that 49% uh, number that we got from the standards group. The okay, solution requirements, these are most of the time we place all of our focus. These are really what gives, what, these are basically what we give to the developers, okay? If we don't get those things right, okay, we, it ends up in costly developer rework. We have budget and schedule overruns, maybe suboptimal solutions. But guess what? If you don't do all three of these things well, you don't really know what the business wants, and you, don't, and you, don't, and you can't make the users and the stakeholders happy and meet their needs, then you can kind of forget about this. And too many organizations, they focus just on these, 
ignore these other two, or they say they do them, but they don't really place the same emphasis on them. These have to all be done, done well and integrated. The transition requirements then are basically how we're going to transition to the new system, how we're going to move from as-is state to to be. Certainly the risk there is system delays, customer service interruptions, or costly rollbacks. So one of the things I've been working with, and by the way, I apologize, this slide is kind of ugly. I, I, I will tell you the colors are, are, are atrocious, atrocious, but anyway. Um, but the concept is good, okay? You should really take the different types of requirements, like business requirements, stakeholder requirements, functional requirements, functional requirement detail, which I call attributes, and then non-functional requirements, and then basically create a model. Okay, in this model, you should look at what are business requirements in your organization. Maybe it's defining the business problem, objectives, uh, these things called features, maybe knowing what impacts and gap analysis to organizational assets or whatever potentially a business case or whatever. So the key thing here is, is to basically build a model, know what needs to be produced in each layer, and kind of who's responsible. Now when you go through this stuff, you're going to find out that um, somebody that's really good at defining a detailed security requirement, they may, not, they may be clueless in terms of how to define objective. So if you look at this thing, if you do a model like this, and you kind of look at, okay, who's going to define what, these are really, this, this, these are basically the requirements that you have to have. This complies with FIBOC and BABOC. The main thing is, is that you can see it's really difficult for one BA to really be able to specialize in all these things. So this really drives in terms of skills that people need to have. It drives how you're going to interface with teams and who's going to do what. And it really drives your documentation. And by the way, the same information applies to Agile just as much as Waterfall. So it, it, it's, it's totally applicable. In Agile, things might change a little bit. You still need a vision and scope here. Stakeholder requirements might be defined as the user story card. Uh, test cases might be defined as user story confirmations. And all this data here might be defined as user story conversations. But the bottom line is the model still, still holds. So I'll look at that. Uh, if you're still using Word and SharePoint, eliminate that. You can't really build good requirements using these things. These things are old. This is based on you know, basically how things worked in the 70s and 80s. However, 70 to 80 percent of organizations continue to use this. You wonder why we still have so many failed projects. It's not surprising to me at all. The evidence is clearly, clearly there. And this is clearly a, 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 a major problem that needs to be resolved. Instead of trying to produce, like I said, these large paper requirement documents, Use containers really consisting of other things, okay, that deliver business value. Okay, like business requirements, maybe they're defined as objectives and impacts. Features maybe is really where you define your solution scope, but then you, you elicit stakeholder requirements around these versus, you know, around these because it's easier. These should all be related, by the way. Uh, solution requirements to quality requirements are normally also included in the feature. Uh, one of the key things is there, you normally would have like a feature sponsor in terms of organization and they would be responsible for this. So this makes it so much easier just in terms of a kind of a breakdown of producing better requirements. Define the basic objectives here. Define the solution scope. The solution scope would normally have a business analyst and a feature sponsor from the business assigned. They would work together to really elicit good stakeholder requirements. Define solution requirements. Reach a, a review and approval. Hopefully things going on simultaneously. Uh, these features then the requirements within here, these, these get reallocated to a bundle, and this is how, actually how we, we're going to build the test the solution. And then releases are actually how we're going to transition. So uh, different concept, easier to manage, much better for managing data, eliminate all the documents. Uh, the same, same information is captured, it's just a, a lot more efficient and a lot faster and a lot less risk. And you're taking, you're kind of winning on everything. From a project management perspective, it would tie in quite well because you actually have you look at PMBOK, these are all the project management things you have to have here on the left. I'm not going to cover that at all. But you would normally, on your work breakdown structure, you would have like a product concept or a vision and scope consisting of this information. Your define and design phase would be features. Within each feature, it would break down into stakeholder requirements, functional requirements, non-functional, and the test and verifications. You then would take those requirements, reallocate them in terms of how you're going to build or acquire the solution. That would become bundles, which you'd actually give to a team. It could also be development iterations if you're using Agile. And then transition and deployment is actually how we're going to deploy it into production. Those would be releases. And that's actually where I would capture transition requirements and then deal with tasks such as data conversion or whatever. 
As you can see, that's taking business analysis concepts, applying it to project management, and really uh, looking at better ways to manage a project. So, in summary, requirements transformation summary, focus on managing data instead of producing paper documents. Okay, use a tool such as like a focus requirements tree instead of Word or Excel. You can't really be that successful. Word or Excel forces you to produce documents. You don't want to do that. You want to manage data. Okay, create and implement a requirements model that includes all of the requirement types specified in Baybach and Pimbach. So I kind of showed you that. You can take the one I have, replace it with what you need to produce. Uh, you'll, you'll find out that uh, that will help a lot. Okay, develop requirements collaboratively instead of in isolation. Okay, so uh, no longer do you just have an analyst producing the requirements. It's actually a shared responsibility. And they're normally like produced in layers. Always define solution scope. These things called features before defining solution requirements. That will help you immensely in terms of producing better requirements. Uh, develop requirements iteratively, incrementally, in layers. And uh, I'm going I'm to kind of move on to the next thing. But as you, you go ahead and read through this, but as you can see, the key thing here is, is that you know, requirements need to be transformed. Producing only solution requirements using Word or Excel simply does not work. We know that. Uh, it's time to move away from that. Okay, well, almost every webinar, people ask me, what about Agile? You know, it's like you're talking about plan-driven. Really, I'm not. I'm really talking about both. Um, Agile, just to be real, real simple, if you look at Scrum, which is the most common form, there's only three roles on an Agile project. There is, no, there is no project manager. There is no business analyst or whatever. There's basically a product owner, there's a team, and there's a Scrum master, okay? Uh, basically, business analysis responsibilities, they're split between the product owner and the team. Uh, you, I've seen organizations that actually have a BA on the team. I've also seen organizations that have a BA uh, serve as the product owner or be the assistant to the product owner. And I've seen organizations that have both. The bottom line is business analysis is split between these two functions. Okay, Realize that and know who's responsible for what. Very important for going forward on Agile. Next thing is realize that there really are differences. The traditional BA, we normally document use cases, functional requirements, UI specs, and business rules. Normally, in Agile BA, we document the themes, ethics, user stories, and then with the user stories, we break them down further. Um, in traditional BA, normally requirements are developed with, uh, there's something like a lot of room for negotiation. They're supposed to be, quote, requirements, you know, what's required. Uh, in Agile, no, they're, they're negotiable. We basically define user stories, and then we negotiate the solution with the team. The team then maybe gives us different solutions. We come back to things, but that's, it's actually done much later in the cycle. We don't do all the stuff up front. Uh, traditional BA, we place all this effort on getting everything right up front and gathering all this detail up front. Agile, uh-uh, we develop just enough detail just in time. So even the team, they're actually doing some of the requirements when they're actually doing the development because that's the way Agile works and that's the way business analysis should work. There's nothing wrong with that. Just realize that some of the business analysis is done by the team. Uh, organizations that think they have to do everything up front, they're not really doing Agile, they're, they're doing some form of waterfall trying to make it look like Agile. Okay, significant efforts produced on large paper documents on traditional BAs. In, in an Agile BA, no, we, we manage things in a backlog. Everything's kind of managed by data. It doesn't have to really be, or sometimes it's paper cards, but um, that's a bad practice too. Uh, traditional business analysis, basically BAs kind of dictate the solution. In Agile BA, uh, the team and the product owner, they would kind of work together really to explore various solutions, quite different. Uh, because you really don't want the solution kind of to totally predefined. Traditional BAs, we, we waste all this time. We're really getting a sign-off and approval. Agile BA, uh, we actually do that kind of with, with a kind of a you know, rigor in terms of a sprint planning session. And we pretty, much, uh, we pretty much have this process down. So we kind of know our time boxes. We plug things into the time boxes and much, much easier. Uh, the same requirement types basically match to Agile perfectly. You still have business requirements, which is called a vision and scope, sometimes broken into themes and epics. You have story, you have stakeholder requirements, which is basically the card part of user stories. You collect these, these three C's. The card is, you know, as a user, I want to do this to achieve some business benefit. And then the developer has conversations, and then they have to know how they're going to confirm it with tests. Okay, so solution requirements, then we, we take the conversations and confirmation piece and that actually equals to the solution requirement. And the transition requirements really are release requirements or conditions of satisfaction. These are like so. Uh, 
Plan-driven project, we might have objectives, features, requirement bundles, and releases. Agile projects, guess what? A, a match. Obje we might have uh, objectives, which is still really good. You might call it a theme. Features, or you could call it an epic. Requirement, you'd call it a user story. Bundle, you'd call a sprint. And a release, you'd call it a release. They, uh, they actually align very well you know, with, with kind of this data, this data paradigm that I'm presenting. So basically, agile requirements transformation, they need improvement too. They are not producing the cost savings that they're supposed to, too many iterations, much better than waterfall, but the bottom line is, is that producing better requirements, having a better process will result in cost savings. So kind of going forward, focus again on managing data. If you're using post-it notes on the wall, bad practice, eliminate that, you, know, you kind of go with the tool. Kind of moving down, best practice now in Enterprise Agile, almost everybody will tell you, don't start with user stories, start with epics and decompose those into user stories. Even going one step further, take the epics, put them into a feature backlog, and that's really what you use to coordinate with business stakeholders. Decompose those into stories, and that's what you use to coordinate with the team, and then probably the team has their own tool, maybe something like JIRA, Rally, whatever. That's where they're actually going to maintain their task. Don't interrupt that. Basically send in stories, let them break down the work because they're supposed to be self-managing. We don't really manage tasks, and so that usually goes into a separate backlog. All we really manage is the product owner or the business analyst kind of doing the product owner role is, is basically the feature in the story backlog. Having a separate feature backlog and story backlog helps a lot. Feature backlog allows you to deal with the business. Story backlog allows you to deal with the team. And then the team manages their own work with the task backlog. So those three backlogs is certainly best practice in enterprise agile, maybe not for uh, single product agile or whatever. Consider three Cs. I mean, remember, a, a story is not complete unless you have confirmation. That's test cases or acceptance criteria. And conversations with the developer. Uh, oftentimes, these conversations, they're verbal, they're not written. Better practice would really be to start, uh, when you have conversations, write down uh, the information that's needed so that uh, you can work with offshore resources, remote resources, or whatever. That being said, um, the, the key thing here is, is really deliver just enough just in time and document just enough in terms of what's needed. Always adjust the level of detail to be efficient, but to have a balance. Try to minimize the number of, 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 of iterations, uh, but don't overproduce paper so that it, so it takes extra time there. That, that would be self-defeating. The key thing is most people will tell you, most agilists will tell you that they, they deliver value. I will tell you they deliver no value because the story in itself delivers no value unless it's deployed and used by a user. Even workable software doesn't really have any real value unless it actually meets the user needs and the user is actually using it to deliver real business value. So the real business value basically comes from these things called features. And the features that actually work that the users start using to really do their jobs, that's the real value. That's kind of where the focus needs to be. Certainly stories are important. And they're certainly important really for managing the development and the agile process. But really don't be fooled. Um, the real value really comes from users using workable software to improve business outcomes that result in increased revenue or lower cost. Okay, so centers of excellence, I'm going to kind of move on to here. I told you there's a lot to present, but I'm almost done. We're, we're, we're getting there. So uh, <clears throat> there's really like three stages of development when, when, for a BA center of excellence. Most people start with project centric, best place to start. Key thing there is focus on better requirements that we went over, focus on Implementing end-to-end -end processes, okay, have a single life cycle ultimately for project manager and business analyst. Try to try and certainly focus on collaboration there, because oftentimes there's a lot of friction there. And then really have consistent application of improved processes and practices, and then really transition from managing requirement documents to managing data. After, by the way, to even go here could take two or three years. Move then to kind of an enterprise focus. And your focus there is just to really do much more things in terms of kind of the portfolio level of project management. So the big thing there is deliver better business outcomes, maximize value, tie it into your enterprise portfolio and decision-making things, and really focus on delivering more benefits. 
phase three, I don't know of any organizations that do this, but um, this is really where they want to go, and it makes a lot of sense. Okay, use business analysis to really achieve a competitive advantage. Focus on outcome-driven innovation, focus on value creation, focusing on breakthrough concepts or whatever. This is the whole concept we talk about innovation. That's basically hitting in phase three. The uh, main thing is start at phase one, go from there. Okay, let's look at just some basic recommendations. I've given you recommendations for other areas. I'm going to give you one that's kind of for COE. First off, don't create an island. Um, too many organizations, they create a center of excellence, and it just serves the business analyst. You have to focus on integrating. If you're going to get value out of business analysis, it spans too many things. Make sure it integrates with the business units. Make sure it integrates with project management. Make sure it integrates with the systems development lifecycle, QA, and really even technical SMEs, okay? Because all of these things are kind of like the key stakeholders. You really have to kind of focus on who are the key stakeholders, how is business analysts really going to gather their needs, and how is it going to deliver it to the developers. Focusing just on the little internal aspects of how to define requirements isn't going to help. You really have end-to-end in, 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 in integration between these different groups. Okay, don't repeat the mistakes over the last 40 years. I've worked with a lot of COEs. I've seen their, their scope and things like that. I'm telling you there's a lot of problems. A lot of them focus just on solution requirements. Uh-uh. Focus on business and stakeholders first. Even get those things correct, then work on your solution requirements. Solution requirements are worthless unless they meet business and stakeholder needs. Okay? Don't focus, try to move away from delivery of technical solutions to delivering business outcomes. The focus should be understanding what business outcomes need to be achieved and coming up with solutions of how you're going to achieve those business outcomes. Okay? Move away from <coughs> creating big requirements up front. Don't repeat that. Go to managing data. Try to go do, do just enough just in time. Okay? Not developing requirements collaboratively, okay, where the business analyst does all the work and there's no other ownership, uh, not, not good practice. Requirements need to be developed collaboratively. They need to be linked, tied together, have a model, know who's doing what, uh, know what's missing. But they are, it is a collaborative process, not a solo process done by kind of one group or whatever. Okay? Um, <clears throat> This is kind of like sacrilegious, but stakeholder review and approval, try to change that so that it's not done at the end once you just produce a document like an event. Try to make it continuous. Try to get stakeholders engaged. If you can get stakeholders and users engaged, okay, where they're giving, they're, they're eliciting, reviewing, improving, giving you additional information, uh, doing some of the requirements for you, your requirements will improve so dramatically that uh, and your solutions will be so much better, it just makes a lot of sense. Try to move away from the stakeholder review and approval process to stakeholder engagement. Okay, um, when you set up a COE, there's kind of like six areas you need to focus on, so a strategic alignment, governance, processes and practices, IT, skills and competency and culture. And kind of my last recommendation is don't, don't take on too much too fast. So these are basically the six areas your COE needs to be aligned with the rest of the business. We kind of talked about that. You need to have a way to govern it. You need to have good processes and practices. Technology really to support your processes and practices. Work on skills and competencies. This may not just be BAs. This may be systems analysts. This may be testers. This may be the business units themselves. Because remember, it's a collaborative exercise. So skills and competencies just providing training to three business analysts isn't going to get you too far. Uh, you're going to have to go further than that. And then really the culture in terms of how these organizations work together, very, very important. So I'm not going to cover these last slides. I actually kind of you know, spelled each one of these things out. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but actually we are going to go ahead and move to questions. And so I will uh, turn that over to uh, my colleague, Andrea Palton. Thank you, John. We do have a few questions, and I'm going to take the questions that are the most repeated questions. Um, there's an Agile question for you. With Agile, where is the documentation for system support? Okay, the uh, documentation for system support normally is, is done in terms of, the, normally you have things called sprints, and you have releases, right? So releases, the system support really go, normally goes into the release. And you, you normally define transition requirements, okay, in terms of how you're going to support. So it is a part of Agile. 
it really deals with, okay, as you're going to transition what you're building to the new solution. So you define the requirements as transition requirements, and you manage the work in terms of as, you, as you're deploying the release, which is normally the work of several sprints going into one, and then as you deploy it into production. Okay, and then I have a question about business rules and the business rules model. It's a two-part question. Is there a difference between the logic model and business rules model? And does all the logic-related attributes not go in business rules? Oh, good question. <laughs> we didn't really cover that. But, um, okay, basically, there is a difference between logic and business rules. And the business rules model really means, okay, and if you look at like the business rules manifesto, Okay, we capture business rules separate from requirements, okay, first of all. So the best practice is don't capture business rules as part of requirements, capture them separate. That being said, they actually constrain requirements. They need to be mapped to requirements. In terms of the logic model, the key thing there is, is basically it is different than the logic model because the logic model has some other things that maybe aren't business rules in terms of calculations. Normally those calculations are driven in terms of your business rules. So... Um, I hope that answered the question. Like I said, I would, I, if, you, if you can write to me, I can actually send you a lot more information. We have a lot of information about business rules. Yes, and I'll echo that, what John said. So look on the screen at the bottom left. You see the info at infocussolutions.com. So you can definitely ask any questions that way. And I also have a few questions about our tool and what the Infocus Requirement Suite looks like. Um, Joe and a few other people, um, make sure that you email me. I will try to email you as well, and we can get you in touch with somebody so you can actually look at the suite that we have. And, and um, I have some test case questions as well, John. Mm -hmm. How are test cases created up front with the requirements? Could you please give, give an example? Oh, wow. Okay. Being real specific on this, I don't have a slide on that, but I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, generally, okay, there's, there's kind of like two models here. Okay, in Agile, you normally develop as a type of user, I want to create something. That's the requirement itself, okay? Now, test, test cases are normally written as what's called confirmations, and they're normally written in a statement such as given when then, okay? So given um, the user is logged on to the system, when the user, given, so when the user does not use the system for 30 minutes, then the, system, the user will be automatically logged off. So that would kind of be basically be a test case. So they're normally written in kind of like given, when, then. Okay, now that being said, best practice is business analysts usually write test cases in the form of acceptance criteria so that users can understand them. If you have a QA member on the team, they normally then take those, those uh, acceptance criteria and they actually write automated test cases in code and they actually execute them, okay? So oftentimes best practices, acceptance criteria, which is kind of the predecessor to test cases, are written by the business analysts and the product owner. The team oftentimes writes the actual test cases themselves in terms of automation and executes those tests, which really makes them reusable. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um, we have about two minutes left. Um, here's another question. In highly regulated environments like banking and healthcare, where traditional documentation is required, how does this paperless process take into account those regulatory standards? Okay. First of all, okay, we basically, in terms of, there's really, really two parts of this question. Okay, basically, I didn't say uh, we wouldn't have the data. We actually would capture the same data, and probably even more, but the bottom line is, Instead of having to really produce a really lengthy paper document, we can still print it in the database, right? So if you take like your CRM process, let's say you're using Salesforce.com or Siebel or whatever, the big thing there is really try to eliminate paper also. But we still have we still have all the data that we captured, okay? So all this data could be printed out. Uh, it's just that you're not really waiting around to produce documents. You're basically you're basically uh, producing data and you're having that data validated, hopefully continuously, and if that data needs to be approved in terms of that it meets some regulatory requirement, okay, those, electro those approvals are done electronically versus, versus some type of manual process. So yeah, the information is captured, it is there, it can be printed, it can be locked down, it can be secured, okay, that, that would actually meet any bank in your healthcare regulation. Uh, 
it can be you know produced as a PDF, but you're not really producing a document, waiting for the approvals or whatever. You're actually delivering things continuously, and hopefully your approvals occur electronically, not um, not not waiting around for big big approvals and missing things. If you can still have all the controls that you need uh, from an internal audit perspective or whatever uh, with, with this process too. You're not giving any of that up. All right, thank Nor you, John. Can you. Okay. Thanks, John. I have, we have about um, um, no time left, so I'm going to turn this over to the modern analyst folks. Well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, John, for a very informative presentation. Thank you to everyone for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I wanted to point out the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. And this concludes today's event, so we hope you have a great day. Hey, thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody. I hope you uh, found the information helpful. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.